Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Madison Realty Capital, Capital One Bank, Eastern Consolidated, New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Customers Bank, AmTrust Title, Aerial Property Advisors, Dime Community Bank. Additional funding has been provided by AVR Realty Company, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Citizens Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Collier's International NYC, Collins Building Services, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handler Real Estate Organization, Handro Properties, Hodges Ward Elliott, Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Stonehenge NYC, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Meringhoff Family Foundation, the Moynian Organization, Moynian Capital Partners, and these friends. A singer, a piano player, a minister, Eagle's Wings, Buffalo, New York, Jerusalem, worldwide, eight books. I have the Reverend Robert Stearns with me. Thanks for being here today. It's great to be with you, Michael. Thanks for having me. Let's go to mom's side, because we know mom's side, especially with grandma, who we have pictures of. Right. We'll talk about mom's side, and then you'll tell me about that side and how they came to America and what how they ended up in Buffalo. Well, the, the family legend is that uh, great-grandma and grandpa Procknell met on the boat coming over from Europe. One from, uh, I imagine, the late 1800s or right. the earliest years of the 1900s. Um, one from Poland and one from, I guess, the border of Poland and Germany. And they were 17, 18 on the boat, met on the boat, landed at Ellis Island and got married. How'd they end up in upstate New York? Well, um, great grandma's first pregnancy was twin boys. And then she had three more kids within four years, then followed up by about a dozen more. She ended up having 15 kids. We have that picture. We, yeah, that's, exactly. That very was, small family. It was a whole tribe. I mean, 16. <laughs> yeah, it was a tribe of them. So they first landed in Maryland, where my great-grandfather worked in the coal mines. Um, but great-grandma Procknell um, was aware of this black lung disease and didn't want her sons growing up in the mines. She was the head of the she family. Was the true patriot. She was the head of the family. And she moved them up to Buffalo, where she opened... The old first ward of Buffalo, which is the the um, the old part of Buffalo, and opened uh, Procknell's restaurant, and basically fed the whole neighborhood during the Depression, um, to the point that today um, the street is named in her honor because of how many families and how many people she helped. So that was great grandma. Great grandma Procknell. Okay, so let's go to the other side of the fam, dad's side. Sure. Dad's side, great grandparents, I don't know as much about, um, but grandpa on dad's side was an English professor at uh, St. Bonaventure University. Um, he was there around the same time that the famous writer Tom and Mer uh, Thomas Merton was there. They were colleagues there at St. Bonnie's. And, uh, and grandma raised uh, four boys and uh, four boys and one daughter. And um, so grandpa 
Stearns instilled in me, I think, a love of books, uh, a love of good literature. Um, he was he was a real a real gentleman. Uh, unfortunately, died when I was very young. I was I was uh, I think 13 when he passed. Do you know how mom met your father? They met in high school. They met in high school up in Buffalo. Up in Buffalo. Okay, now tell me a little bit about dad. Dad was in the real estate broker. He was. He he um, he was self-made. He 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 just found his way into real estate and became first an agent and then a broker and then bought the agency that he was working at and then eventually became president of the Buffalo Board of Realtors and then trained um, uh, real estate agents all over upstate New York. Um, it's, it's funny to this day, if you bump into a real estate agent in, in Buffalo and you bring, you know, they'll, they'll meet me and they'll say, Bob Stearns, you know, he trained me, he, he did the training. So real estate was really, um, was really his, his career. So tell me about, you're born what year? You're 68. So it's 1968 in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about the early years, you know, uh, you, because you said the family used to go to church quite a bit. Right. The whole extended family was very Catholic, um, nuns, priests, my cousin is a priest, my great aunt is a nun. So the, the extended family was very Catholic. But when I was just one or two years old, um, really it was a moment in American history where what we would call the evangelical movement, typified by people like Dr. Billy Graham uh, and others like him, that was really sweeping its way across America with fresh fervor. And so my parents uh, found meaning in that. Yeah, this was the Assembly of God? Well, that, that eventually led to the Assembly of God. Yeah, the Assembly of God is a part of the broader evangelical movement. So my parents left Catholicism, which was a bit of a, a big deal, you know. I didn't have much of a choice. What, what, what about Grandpa on the other side? They were not happy. Uh, yeah, they, they were not thrilled. So, um, so I grew up kind of in this dual reality of the evangelical church on Sunday, but my entire extended family having a very Catholic background. Did you ever go to parochial school? I didn't go to parochial school, but we would do, you know, Christmas Eve mass and different things like that with the family. And, you know, I really appreciate it because, Michael, I feel like I had the best of both worlds. Um, evangelical Christianity, I think, is a markedly American experience. It's part of it's part of the last century of American history. Um, there's a wonderful sense of, um, uh, oh, what's the word? Just, I would say, spiritual authenticity within evangelical Christianity. But from the Catholic background, you really had that sense of reverence and you had that sense of um, tradition uh, and and I, so I, I really have a deep appreciation for both of these expressions, which I think led me to my sense of profound appreciation for Judaism. But that comes later in the story, and I don't so, want to jump so, ahead. Let, let's talk about growing up, because you, you said to me you had some odd jobs. There was once a, a job with a drugstore, I think, right? <laughs> and some of these other. Yeah, my Bob Reardon gave me my first job. Um, I didn't even know if it would be legal today, but back yeah, you were 12, right? I was like 13 and I was counting out the, the medicine pills back in the back. I don't think, I doubt that's legal today. You probably have to have some kind of a degree for it. But yeah, the, the drugstore was probably my first job. Very strong work ethic. Every, yeah, did, every part of the family. To, did you go to work with dad also? I would, I worked for dad by cleaning his office every Saturday, would clean the office, mow the lawn. Uh, you know, shovel the snow. I mean, you made a lot of money shoveling snow up in, in Buffalo. Buffalo. No question. <laughs> in it was fact, a, it was a good location to be our, in that business. Our, our, our road was on a, a hill that in the bad snowstorms, you would go out and you would push the cars up the hill and they'd give you five bucks when you got them up to the top of the hill. How did you get involved with uh, playing the piano, playing musical instruments, and then singing. That was my mother's side of the family, all very musical. My grandfather would play the organ all the time. And so just from a young age, that was just, and again, also the evangelical church has a very strong emphasis on when, music. When, in your opinion, when, when did you get the calling or the, the thought that you wanted to get involved with the ministry full time? Because you went to college for the ministry. I did, yeah. My, my degrees, I have two degrees, one in music and one in theology. Right. But, but I, I don't remember a time not feeling like 
my life would be in the realm of the church somehow, whether it was going to be teaching or pastoring or what the specifics were, I didn't know. But I, from honestly, my, my youngest years, I would go during the summers, there's a camp on uh, Lake Chautauqua, a Christian camp. And those were phenomenal summers. And, and they were really formative in um, helping me have a sense that you could uh, live for hopefully a higher purpose and, and, and really make a, make a difference. And so that was just instilled in me from a young age. Now, it was good that you were a musician because we have a picture later on that during college and later on also, you were able to, uh, to pay for college via being a singer and entertainer with the, the group. I, I, I sang for my tuition as opposed to my supper. My freshman year, we started a music group and um, we began traveling around to churches on the weekends and the school realized that we were having some success. And so the school ended up hiring us to represent them and do public relations and marketing for the school. So we would travel every weekend and then all summer long. And it was a phenomenal experience because, you know, up and down the Eastern seaboard, you know, every state, every city, meeting all kinds of incredible people, putting your way through college. Now, how do you decide to go to the, that the college, the theological college? Well, and let me just say, to this day, I'm friends with the folks that, you know, that traveled together. I went to that school. Um, it was one of several that I applied to, and it's the only one that I got a full scholarship to. So I got a, I, I received what was known as the President's Scholarship. They chose one student per year for a full, uh, a full ride, room, board, tuition, everything for so four years. You, you got two degrees, you said. You got yeah. one in music and one in theology. Yeah, University of Valley Forge. Right. Just outside Philadelphia. At 21, what happens? You told me Kansas City or something? A very a brief stopover in Kansas City, um, which then led me to my first visit to Jerusalem. But let's talk about how that first visit took place, okay? <laughs> there was a young lady involved? There, there, uh, there, there was. I, I was. I was. Uh, you know, at least we're telling the true story okay. of, Robert, <laughs> of the Reverend Robert Stearns. I... I um, I met, uh, I met a young lady uh, who uh, I was smitten with and began, you know, this was, this was, there was no internet, right? You couldn't, you couldn't FaceTime, there was no iPhones. Right. So there was, there was some letters back and forth and some phone calls. Now, where was she from in America? She, was, it was, she had lived in Israel for many, many years. Um, uh, but I went over to see if this romance would, would lead anywhere and we dated for a few months. Um, but that didn't that didn't uh, end up anywhere. But there was the visit to the hotel. That the young rabbi. That was the inspiration, right? That was a transformative moment in my life. You know, I, Michael, when I went to Israel, it was primarily to see if this relationship would go anywhere. But I had a rabbi, Rabbi Gerald Meister, who many New Yorkers knew and love, and he he would say, "God writes straight on crooked lines." You know, God can get us where we're going in many different ways. And uh, I ended up that first, I, not it was my first time in Israel, it was my first time outside of America. My, my worldview was about an inch and a half wide. Right, it was Buffalo and... It was Valley Buffalo Forge. and American evangelicalism. That's right. all I knew. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm hearing and understanding the story of the Jewish people. I've never encountered Jewish people before. I've never understood the scope of Jewish history. I've never understood um, modern Zionism and the rebirth of the state of Israel. And all of this is hitting me with the backdrop of all of these scriptures that portend and foretell this regathering of the Jewish people. So it was a definitive and somewhat jarring moment for me. But you said it was this young rabbi that really had There was a, a young, idea. he was a rabbinic student. He was right. studying at uh, a yeshiva of a famous New York rabbi, Rabbi Shlomo Riskin, who had been famously the leader Lincoln, of Lincoln, Lincoln Square. Square Synagogue, and today is a dear, dear friend of mine. But he was studying at Rabbi Riskin's yeshiva. I didn't know that at the time. I didn't know who Rabbi Riskin was from, from anything. I didn't know anything. Um, but the, there was a bookstore and it was the only place in town you could get Time Magazine and Newsweek. And, you know, this is again, 25, 30 years ago. And so it, he and I struck up a friendship. He was from Toronto. He was studying in yeshiva at Rabbi Riskin's. 
And he's the one who brought me to the Kotel and said, let me explain to you what's happening here. And I'm looking at all of these Jews who are praying and they're praying to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, this is the God I pray to. I pray to him through Jesus, but I pray to that same God. And I'm saying, these are not Hindus. These are not Buddhists. These are not Muslims. I came from these people. So how can my relationship with them be the same as other faith groups when I have an absolute undeniable link and, and causal effect from them to my faith system? So it began a journey that now 25 years later has brought me to Israel close to 100 times, and I've brought about 20,000 people to Israel with me. You come back to America. Yes. And then you decide to create Eagle's Wings. So you asked me about my sense of calling. Prior to this, my sense of calling was very vague. I didn't really know what it would, you know, will I be a pastor? Will I teach? Will I do music? I didn't know what I would do. In Israel, I found a definitive sense of calling. And that was to help build a bridge between the Jewish people and modern day Christianity and to help strengthen that understanding. And now let's bring up another interesting thing about grandpa. Right, right. Grandpa was not very happy about this. Well, the truth is, uh, and it's a sad truth, but it is a truth, is that that, that particular grandfather was, was tremendously anti-Semitic. And I never understood that. And I didn't even understand what he was really talking about, but there were all these ideas of, of conspiracy theories, et cetera, et cetera, and, and the Jews were, bl we couldn't get through a holiday meal without the Jews being blamed for something. Um, so that was always there in the backdrop, but I never understood um, that kind of, of that was sentiment. Gra was Grandpa alive when you came back and created Eagle's Wings? Um, he was, but he was in very poor health. Yeah, he was living, but in poor health. Okay, so let's talk about the growth of Eagle's Wings. Right. The three, the three virtues and the three char the major characteristics. Yeah, we, we try and we have, a, we have a wonderful community. I, any success that I have is because I have an incredible team of people who have walked this journey with me, many of them for 10, 15, 20 years. I mean, our, our core staff, our core team have been on this spiritual pilgrimage together. And, and uh, I'm so blessed and honored to walk alongside of an incredible group of people. But there were three core values that we felt marked the territory for Eagle's Wings. One was, how do we recapture what I would call biblical spirituality? And what I mean by that is this, the church uh, largely has become an institution. I think people distrust modern religion because it has become a machine. It's become an industry. It's become an institution. And when you look at scripture or when you look at at great Bible teachers, uh, great prophetic leaders, when you look at the life of Jesus, you see community. You see small communities of people doing life together and inviting God's light and presence into everyday circumstances. You don't see massive pomp and circumstance. So how do we recapture simple, authentic spiritual community? That's number one. Number two is the sense of connection between Judaism and Christianity, which Michael, I would say some of your viewers might not know, is a modern day phenomenon right now. There are today, conservatively, 600 million evangelicals globally. And evangelical Christianity has a philo-Semitic theological construct. And so we're living in a moment unthought of for 2000 years of history where uh, the, the evangelical portion of the Christian church, for sure, not exclusively, but definitively, is connecting to the Jewish roots of their faith. And then number three is to build bridges of goodwill and relationship with all people groups. So let's talk about number three, because in sure. 2002, you created the, the Day of Prayer right. in Jerusalem. Tell me about that. Well, it was started right here in New York. Uh, as so many of these stories start, it was uh, the Israeli consulate had been doing uh, a celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King, which understandably had many African-American clergy involved. And they contacted me and they said, we, we'd like to reach out to other clergy as well and let them feel welcome. So we thought it would be a one-off event. We had incredible response. They invited us to come back and do it again. This is where Rabbi 
Dr. Gerald Meister comes in and also David Nekrutman. And this was the day in Israel? It, the... it started here, we did two here, okay. and then it was decided at the second one, we need to launch this okay, in Israel. Okay, so we started here in 2002. That's right. Then in 2003 or 2004? 2004, we launched in the Rose Garden of the Knesset. We had 5,000 Christians from about 100 different nations. Now, as you said to me when we got together, it was started in October, so it would coincide relatively close to Yom Kippur. Exactly. Yeah, we decided that uh, the first Sunday of October would be set aside. And Michael, today, conservatively, we have about 90 million people participating. Uh, in a, we have representatives in 174 nations, and the materials translated annually into 39 languages. So it's a phenomenon, really, and it all grew out of these little meetings here in New York. You know, New York takes things and, and lets it catch on in the world. We have a picture of the ministers bringing the, the young ministers to Israel. Well, what we're finding is that this next generation of evangelicals um, have a theoretical support for Israel, but unlike their parents, many of them have not been there. For whatever reason, they just haven't gone on these trips. And so we are reaching out to young, um, influential, millennial evangelical leaders coast to coast and we are bringing them on a trip. And by the way, Michael, not only introducing them to the Jewish community, but introducing them to the Palestinian community, letting them hear the stories of their Palestinian Christian brothers and sisters and interacting with members of the Muslim community. We can't be honest brokers for peace if we are not aware and empathetic with the narrative on all yeah, sides. You've, you've been to the Knesset, you've been at the UN. Yeah. What, what were you doing at these events? Well, the Knesset, I was privileged alongside um, many different leaders to follow alongside uh, a man named Dr. Yuri Stern, who was an amazing Russian leader of the Jewish people, was imprisoned in the former Soviet Union, made Aliyah to Israel and launched what is called the Knesset Christian Allies Caucus. And that is thriving now today and has sister caucuses in parliaments, I think. In is some, that how you met Sharansky? I've met him several times, but the main first time he came to speak at the Day of Prayer event. So he spoke for us at the Day of Prayer for the Peace of now, Jerusalem. Now, what about Elie Wiesel? Elie Wiesel and I met and worked together at a, a protest at the United Nations. Uh, over Iranian uh, nuclear capacity and calling for the for a resistance to the uh, the issue with Iran. And now you have an involvement with the U current UN ambassador. Uh, Danny uh, Danny Danon is Danone. in a. Whenever time Danny sees me, he says, "Robert, they've sent Daniel into the lion's den. You know, <laughs> they've sent him into the United Nations. Right. He's doing an amazing job there, representing Israel." Now you said to me you also do a feeding program in, in Israel. We do. Like you know, a, I, I I think again back to the first value, which was what spiritual community. If we ever lose sight in the midst of all of the issues of around the world, if we ever lose sight of the fact that people are hurting, you know, I mean, you and I are blessed and, and, and we, we've, we've, been, we've been blessed or favored or lucky or whatever term you want to say, there are people who are really hurting. So we have two feeding centers that we operate in Israel, one on the Sea of Galilee and one in Jerusalem. And we make it a point uh, that those feeding centers are open to everyone. They're open to Jew, Arab, Christian, Muslim, Druze, Ethiopian, who, who, whoever you are, wherever now, what, you're what from. What are you doing around the country right now? I know that, that you recently, uh, Kathy Lee Gifford was uh, an honoree. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you've been with Jay Leno and other people. But what are the programs that Eagles Wings is doing domestically as opposed to the day of prayer right. and the, the Jewish uh, relationships? Well, domestically, I mean, there's many, many things. But to put it in a nutshell, Michael, I will be successful if I can replicate what happened to me that day in the Kotel, where a light bulb went on and my view of history and of God and of scripture and of our world shifted because I understood that the Judeo-Christian worldview that Western civilization has been built upon came from a people who have been persecuted throughout the generations. And now we have an opportunity to, to mend that breach. And so what we do nationally is reach out to churches and young leaders across the nation who really are, are hungry to say, where did our, what, what is the foundation of our faith? And what do the Hebrew scriptures teach? And, and what do the rabbis say on this? And we're able, city to city to city. I was, in, I was in Beverly Hills Thursday night with our friend Pat Boone. Pat and Shirley are wonderful supporters of ours. Uh, and, and, and we were there and just, we brought together about 
20 pastors and about 20 different Jewish leaders and just wonderful friendship and dialogue um, that is springing up around the world. Now, let's talk about some of the performances. How'd you end up at Carnegie Hall or Lincoln Center? Carnegie Hall, one of the, one of the events that we do, we do an event called Celebrate Israel um, that we do around the world. And by the way, again, we just did one in Ohio and we had a wonderful Palestinian uh, who was with us there and, and just we, we shared with him and we're careful to spread our support to, to everyone who's in need there. But this particular one we, we did at Carnegie Hall, I think three years ago, we did a Celebrate Israel event. And there were several artists there, a, a famous pianist, Dino Kartsanakis, Sandy Patty, Larnell Harris, uh, Ido Aharoni was then the Consul General, and uh, they invited me to sing there at that yeah, event. And then we have the photo of you with our mayor and the Cardinal. How'd that? That was one of the greatest honors of my life. Um, I was with um, our friend Rabbi Joe Potasnik and uh, singing at an event for uh, Mayor Bloomberg. And the, organiz the organizers of the 15-year anniversary of 9-11 at St. Patrick's heard me sing and asked if I would come and be the soloist uh, at St. Patrick's on the 15th year anniversary of 9-11. That was a solemn and amazing uh, event. My children will remember that for the rest of their lives. They were there with me. Uh, a couple of things before we talk about the children. How did you decide to write all these books? I... I love writing. I, I, think it's a, I think it's a privilege um, to be able to try to leave something for the next generation. And you know, books have been used for evil and books have been used for good. You know, you talk about my grandfather and one of the shocks of my life going through his things after he passed was finding one of the original copies of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, you know, that had been published here in America by Henry Ford. And it just blew my mind, you know, to find this. So books, books can be used for evil or for good. And so I try to, to put pen to paper. I mean, now today it's a... Uh... You have three sons. Yeah. Isaac is uh, 15 and he's about three inches tall, <laughs> taller than me. And uh, he's getting ready to make his uh, 18th trip to Israel. And the twins. And my twins, Michael and Daniel, turned 11 this past Saturday. Now here's the biggest question. Sure. How do you get young people to get involved with the, with the movement? How do you get the, the young community right. to go to the evangelical churches? I think there is an unspoken need that once they hear it, they realize this is a missing piece in my life. You know, and once you verbalize that, well, what do the Hebrew scriptures say? What should... But, but how do you get the so, ministry... Social I mean, media, Facebook, YouTube... Events like the one we just did you in know, Beverly Hills. It's, it's like when I said, when I had the uh, Monsignor Jamie, Julian Tanella, he said he goes to coffee shops. Yeah. Okay, because he, he doesn't personify what you expect as a Monsignor or a priest. Right, right. Okay, I believe that's what's necessary yeah. today to keep the movement. Okay, all of these programs are great, but if we can't get the next generation in there, the next generation of Robert Stearns, we're not going to be... Good. It's got to be totally organic and relational. Millennials don't relate to institutions or organizations. They relate to stories and to people. And so inviting them into the story, inviting them into the journey is what seals the deal with millennial leaders. And thank you so much for being here today. It's an honor and a privilege.